many of us now know that, you know, we have this concept that there's trauma in our DNA. And what really ignited me in wake was something that I've been saying to no one for years. Like, no one. <laughs> Welcome to More to Come, PW Comic World's weekly podcast on graphic novel and comics publishing. I'm Calvin Reed, Senior News Editor of Publishers Weekly, Editor of PW Comics World, and Editor of The Fanatic, PW's twice a month comics and pop culture newsletter. Check us out online at publishersweekly.com slash comics. Okay, uh, More to Come listeners, we've got a real uh, treat for you today. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking with Dr. Rebecca Hall about her Really, her acclaimed gra graphic memoir, graphic series, nonfiction. We're going to go into all of what it is and what it uh, and what it has become uh, in just a second. It's called "Wake: The Hidden History of Women-Led Slave Re Revolts." Uh, it was a PW Best Book of the Year in 2021 uh, and received similar acc accolades around the business. Um, uh, she did this with artist Hugo Martinez. It is a riveting combination of graphic memoir, inspirational scholarship, uh, a story of how pop culture works and how misrepresentations of slavery have come, come all the way to this day and how we are addressing those. Uh, but we're also going to be talking about how the book has been adapted into a fully cast audio drama uh, by the acclaimed playwright, Tyler English uh, Beckwith. Uh, she's here today. Uh, directed by Simone uh, Barros and starring acclaimed actress DeWanda Wise as Dr. Rebecca Hall and with original music. There's really more to come here. Let me give you a quick introduction of, of everybody very quickly and then we'll get to it. First off, Dr. Rebecca Hall, author of this great nonfiction work as well as its central character. These bios are a little brief, but we're going to go through them so we can get to talking. She is a JD, a PhD, independent scholar, activist, educator, and now comics writer, uh, who writes on the history of race, gender, law, and resistance. And to quote a line from the audio drama, she is a teacher, a lawyer, a historian, and a detective in this book. Next, Dr. <laughs> Hartman, a distinguished historian and university professor at Columbia University, a MacArthur Fellow, exclamation point, mm -hmm. there, as well as author of multiple scholarly works, among them, scenes of seduction, terror, slavery, and self-making in 19th century America from Oxford University. President, I think, a new edition from Norton. Also, Tyler English Beckwith, an acclaimed and award-winning playwright, filmmaker, and actress, originally from Dallas, now in New York. Uh, Tyler holds an MFA in drama dramatic writing from uh, NYU Tisch, two BAs in African and African diaspora and studies, and theater and dance from UT Austin. Uh, also an incredible list of accomplishments and credits. And not least, uh, but the, the last of our, our finalists, Dewanda Wise, an established and exciting actor in film, TV and theater, as well as being a writer and producer. She appears as the iconic Nola Darling in the TV adaptation of Spike Lee's wonderful, memorable film, 1988 film of the same name. Thank you all for being on More to Come. So very briefly, a history of women-led slave revolts. It, it's, and when I encountered this book, uh, it blew me away. And as we were chatting earlier, of course, I, I had another, it kind of two ships passing, you know, kind of encounter with Dr. Hall at the Black Comic Book Festival that's held annually at the Schoenberg Library. This book, I mean, it, it maps her journey to becoming a historian. And this is someone who started out as a lawyer, frustrated by the, the criminal justice system, and her own uh, personal needs and used, went into this, this uh, researching the history of slave revolts led by women. Within this also, it, it shows her dogged efforts to research the slave trade, uh, and particularly two slave revolts, one in 1708 and one in 1712. Uh, it's a passionate and academic quest that highlights the role of the archivist, I think, in ways that we don't see very often. The audio drama, of course, adds a whole other dimension to this, uh, and we're going to talk about that. So to get started, I'm going to go qu quickly to Dr. Hall. Very first, can you describe, you know, wait for our listeners, 
Uh, and then, you know, the circumstances around the book, but then shift over to the, you know, the, the, the early circumstances around uh, the audio drama. So the book was actually me turning my dissertation into a graphic narrative as a cabin. I'm not, I don't love the term graphic novel because novel implies fiction to me, but I don't know that I'm going to be able to change that whole genre categorization on my own. But, uh, That's an ongoing debate. So I hear you. Yes. Okay, but, I, uh, you may notice, I try to call it graphic nonfiction whenever I can. Okay, good, good. So maybe but between the two of us, we'll get it. Okay, <laughs> we'll, we but, can change um, the industry. Right. Sure. <laughs> right, and so I wrote the book, I started the book uh, in 2017 uh, after I got fired from my last job and wanted to come out of this feeling like, okay, if I'm leaving, if I'm sort of being forced away from this profession that is my calling, this research that I spent so much time and heart creating, I wanted to somehow be out in the world. And somehow that idea came in the form of a graphic um, narrative, which I know nothing about. I mean, now I do, but at the time I knew nothing about it other than reading them. I mean, I've been a fan, right? So, um, and then the audio drama, I'm still trying to understand how that happened. A part of it I can explain with a little bit of a, like a weird legal legal loophole, if that's helpful at all, which is that usually when Simon & Schuster or these big publishers acquire a book, they acquire audio rights for the book, but no one needed audio rights for a graphic narrative. It didn't make any sense, so they didn't reserve those rights. And so it created this sort of weird carve out for the company Podium to come in that was looking at creating dramas that were kind of more serious, engaged with more serious topics than the, the sci-fi stuff they usually do. I love sci-fi, I'm not gonna show up the book of life. But um, so that's sort of how it happened. And then then, um, then Podium connected me and Tyler. Tyler, you and I were like working on this for like a year and a half, like, right? Yeah, very, I think we connected pretty early in the pandemic, actually. Mm -hmm. Sometime in 2020, so it was um, it was a pretty long process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. did you start thinking about this or being engaged about the audio drama while you were still working on the book, or was the book complete? Me? Yeah. So the book was actually turned in. It was in that period between it's turned in and it's going to come out. I think mm -hmm. it was like I was at the Schomburg where, working on my second book, which has been paused because Wake kind of came took ate my life which is a good thing, but I'm looking forward to getting back to my current project. Um, and um, so what happened was is that um, I think, Tyler, I think it was like early, like winter 2021. And we had a few uh, meetings and it was really, frankly, it was like not on my, like, I wasn't really thinking about it too much, except for like every few months, Podium will put together a call between you and me and we talk about the, the current draft and somehow it evolved into a story that was more about how the book came to be than than trying to parallel what happened in the book. Right. And I think that happened because of the many like fruitful conversations that we had together. Um, because I feel like narratively the graphic narrative is a story that didn't really need much adaptation. I felt like the way that it is consumed was sort of already perfect to me. And what I found more interesting is when you would tell me everything about your life and I'd be like, okay, and then what else happened? And then like they fired you and why? And what? how did you react? And then once um, we were on Zoom, so when I would see like, Bayo walking around in the background and she'd sort of like chime in with like, yeah, they fired her and we had to move to Utah. I just got mm -hmm. more and more interested in your personal journey. And I felt like as we progressed with each draft, um, we responded more and more to Rebecca, the protagonist, than just like retelling this, the story that already was sort of perfectly encompassed in the book that you were, wrote. Can I just jump in? Because I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's really your journey. I mean, as, it, as powerful as your research is, the, you, the story of 
of what you went through is so amazing as well. But so could you tell our listeners a little bit about how you came to be a historian, uh, someone who started out as a lawyer? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've always loved history. Um, you know, uh, it's always been a passion of mine, but I decided that I was going to go like the choice was law degree, l- lawyer or history PhD. And at the time I was making that decision, I was like, what, 24, 23. <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to feel really trapped in an ivy, ivory tower. Is it an ivy tower or an ivory tower? <laughs> I can never, I'm looking at Saidia who's in an ivory tower. I think it's an ivory tower. <laughs> okay, that one. Um, and so um, I want to be out in the world doing things, having direct impact. So that was the decision. And after eight years of that, I'm like, okay, I'm out. I'm ready to go back to what I really wanted to do. Yeah. And I just want to say before we move on that Tyler, like what you're, as you're describing it, because we haven't really debriefed at all since it went into production. It's like, I remember at some point it was you or maybe uh, Maggie from Podium who was walking us through this whole process. It's like, your character needs more of a narrative arc. Like there needs to be, a, and I'm like, uh, and then I was like this, and I remember like recording for you, like telling you the story of being fired four times, which you masterfully combined into two <laughs> um, on a, like recording it. And, you know, and I remember just being like, just like crying, just like, this is really painful. And, um, but then I gave it to you and you just, I mean, it was incredible what you did, what you did with it. You know, a, a part of what I'm trying to uh, trying to get at here is the, it, some of the things you encountered in the criminal justice system. One of the things about the book is it, it talks about your frustration have uh, defending black defendants in 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 criminal justice. And except for I wasn't, I didn't do, I didn't do uh, criminal defense. I was a tenants' rights attorney. That's so, what I mean. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's yeah. exactly what I mean. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to get you to talk about because I think it's a really interesting jumping off point for the book. Yeah. So I, I was always I worked with homeless families when I graduated from college. I spent two years in New York City, back home in New York. Um, and there was a, a crisis of homeless families happening in the early 80s in New York. So this was, you know, when I was a young adult, homelessness wasn't seen as this endemic constant thing. It was like, whoa, what's happening? You know, of course, there's always been poverty, but shelter poverty, like families are on the street because they have no place to live. That was kind of new thing. And we, I thought that we could just fix this problem if we just sued a few people and, you know, it, things would be good. And Whatever. So, and I, I was always interested in this issue because, you know, I spent several months homeless as a as a kid. Um, my family, let me say, like, is like uh, there's this great line from a song: "Born into a family built like an avalanche." You know, it's just like insane. It was crazy, and so, and also a lot of really intense substandard housing issues, like safety issues, and so I've I've always been drawn to that issue and wanting to help people with it, and so that's how I ended up going into law and choosing that particular that particular thing. Well, I'm going to jump around to the other members of the pan- panel. Why don't I start with uh, Dr. Hartman? I, I, and, I, and really, I'd just like to hear your reactions to the book and what you thought when you first encountered it. Yeah, I mean, I love WIG. Um, one of the things that I really so admire is the ability to bring these really important historical and scholarly questions to the fore, but in a way that's totally accessible and a way that's really heartfelt. And so you have the journey of the questing, you know, protagonist, historian. Um, and I mean, I think what, you know, Rebecca does or Dr. Hall, what Dr. Hall does that many historians are reluctant to do is actually to talk about feelings, what it means to sit with that history and um, the kind of grief and ancestral work that's, you know, that's a part of it. Um, And so I just found that very moving. I think that there's a dialogue between a whole history of like, you know, nonfiction and creative literature about slavery and its wake that um, the book is in dialogue with. And sometimes you see that in terms of the way Beloved is in the pages, the you know quotes from Maya Andrew Lord, all those p- 
people and, you know, I feel like, and more subtly, like it's dialogue with something like Nobese Zong, Christina Wakes, um, Sharps in the Wake. In the Wake, yeah. Idea Hartman's Lose Your Mother. So it, yes. it's in that tradition. And I think that that's really powerful. I think what I was like really surprised by, and I think it's actually really great, is that the audio drama is its own thing. Mm -hmm. So that you get to have these two very distinct experiences. They're not redundant at all. So I think I was surprised by that because when I first started listening, I thought, okay, yeah, I am I know what this will be. Mm -hmm. But in fact, um, you know, it was a total other thing. And um, and I just want to say something about that ancestral work. I mean, um, and, I, and I hope there's a sequel to this. Like, I, I don't know what the second book is, but it seemed like that ascending figure on the last page was promising um, a sequel. But, you yeah, know. Too. <laughs> yeah. I just you know, got the I, tattoo. It's still uh, in process. Uh, but she is rising on my arm. Uh, yes, <laughs> yeah. And, um, and I guess, uh, you know, the other thing um, about the ancestral work, the family stories, which were so moving, and I don't want to embarrass Rebecca, but she's also from a very particular kind of family. <laughs> yes. And, um, and so there's, you know, I love the attention to the kind of, you know, your grandmother's legacy. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, your father and your uncle as these like, you know, very committed black radicals. So I feel that in your work, you're, although very differently, just kind of carrying on that tradition. So, so those are just some of the things I want to offer. Thank you. And let me jump to the, the, the Wanda involved in this too. Could it, we get your reaction also to the book? What, what were your thoughts when you first encountered it? Um, I think experientially, you know, I just got chills and I felt an automatic sense of recognition. I think on one hand, what Rebecca's experience has been professionally, academically, you know, as a black queer women, woman is, <laughs> it was so painfully true. And, and, um, and I think really crosses um, every, you know, everywhere. It's just, it's just white supremacy, right? It's just any industry you go in, you, we come across these same, um, you know, uh, barriers and changing goalposts and um, the kind of uh, waving the flag of liberalism, but like not really mm -hmm. wanting to do the work um, of, of social change. So I felt it both, you know, on a, in terms of like bringing, you know, her voice to the audio drama to light, I, I felt that kind of recognition. And, and then on a, a macro level, when I think about our conversations, our ongoing conversations about representation of, you know, enslavement in the Americas, in the United States of America, it seems to me that we have really, uh, Black folks have really internalized white supremacy in a way that has made us go, I'm sick of these stories and there's like five. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my heart. Exactly. Yeah. It really breaks my heart because mm -hmm. it makes me feel like, oh wow, it's been successful. Like this, this, you know, attempt to be like, don't talk about that anymore, to really, you know, make us internalize that shame. It makes me feel like it's been a success. And we don't know as much as we should. Uh, we, many of us now know that, you know, we have this concept that there's trauma in our DNA. And what really ignited me in wake was something that I've been saying to no one for years, like, no one. <laughs> but something that I've just been kind of screaming into the void, like, well, what else is in our D like, if that is, if trauma is in our DNA, is it resilience? Isn't that natural fight? Isn't resourcefulness? Aren't all these other things, you know, these amazing things, um, this, the, my capacity, the, the, the entrepreneurs of, in my family from day one, generations and generations and generations, I go 10 generations back in Maryland. You know, I'm, I'm very proud of my history. I'm very proud of my family and my ancestors. And, you know, I just, I remember reading the graphic nonfiction for the first time and just <laughs> like, 
oh, oh. <laughs> just being awash with relief, mm. you know? Um, and that's just inherent in my work of, of feeling like I wanted, I want to tell stories where I'm like, oh, I'm not the only one, thank God. Um, and that's what I felt, you know? And I, I, I still remember very vividly and, and viscerally my first conversation with Rebecca. Um, and it was just, you know, clear, just super, super clear to me in a very, very meaningful way. I remember it too. And I feel so lucky that you, you took up this project, Dewanda. Important. I, I'm going to jump back to uh, to Tyler again. I mean, you you've talked a little bit about about the beginnings of the audio drama. Do you want to elaborate that on any more? I mean, I mean, at what point did you like? Yeah, this is going to happen, and this is what we need to do. Well, I mean, just on a basic level, I wanted a job, so I was like, J O B, you know, J O B. This is the we were in the middle of the J O B too. <laughs> we were in the middle of the pandemic. I like, you know, things were going, things were happening. Um, but once I <laughs> talked to um, Rebecca, I was just like, oh my gosh, I'm obsessed with this person. Rebecca also like became my own tenants rights lawyer because I was in the process of moving back to New York. And I was like, they don't, the condo board keeps denying me. I keep changing my name and age. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> and she was like, and I was moving to Harlem for the first time and she knew the area very well. So just <laughs> off, like right off the bat, we had a personal connection that had nothing to do with Wake. Mm -hmm. um, but I was also, ready to sue uh, the, the landlord there on, on her. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, mm -hmm. listen, I actually moved into a building truly like 300 feet from that building. So I just walk past and like stare just to see if she'll like walk out or something. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Long story short, racist searing practices. Yeah. You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I think my connection to Wake um sort of like what Dewanda said, I have like a deep familial connection and it's actually come back to me very recently. Um, I lost my grandmother two months ago mm -hmm. and um, trying to describe to the people who I work with, most of whom are not black, that like what it means to lose my grandmother is very mm -hmm. similar, if not the same thing of what it means to lose my mother is like a concept that they don't understand, sort of that like intergenerational com uh, community connection. It's just like, mm -hmm. they just like couldn't mm -hmm. understand why it was mm -hmm. such a deep thing. I'm like, this is mm -hmm. not like, you know, I, I've never like called out of work and lied and said my grandma was dead. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? Like this is, this is like my true foundation. Mm -hmm. And I feel like thinking about what drew me to Wake was thinking about Rebecca, her father, her grandmother. Um, those were connections that I understood very viscerally and also understood the pain of retelling. And I feel like I understand mm -hmm. it even more now that mm -hmm. I'm trying to explain to folks like <laughs> why this is such a big deal in my life now that my grandmother has passed because the retelling of like impact, I feel like I never knew um, what like sort of that performance brings out of you when you mm. have to like retell and retell and retell. And I feel like in the, in the early days of us talking about Wake, um, I was very drawn to when Re Rebecca was talking about having to take breaks when she was like researching all these things, going through the archives and just like having to say, I can't consume all of this information right now. Mm -hmm. that this is too, it's almost like too much to know as a person, like no, mm -hmm. like as a person, how am I supposed to carry all of this information? Um, and I feel like that was such an interesting idea, not even idea, an interesting just story that she told me that I couldn't even imagine that being a part of your job. Yeah. And so as we were going through, or as I was going through sort of working on like a traditional plot, I think Bea, that character and the person became very important to me because she was representing like a homeland, home base where Rebecca, the protagonist could return to um, when not only the research became too much, but like, you know, the, the, the material conditions of being a teacher and not being able to work or being mm -hmm. fired, working in these um, situations where you're not being supported. I felt like that character 
it took me a while to get there, but I felt like once I got there, the character represented this sort of um, this this safe home home space for for Rebecca. And we just we just celebrated our thirty third anniversary last week, so two weeks ago, yeah. Well, yeah. the book and the audio drama, you always, you do indeed periodically return to this home space to kind of work it out. So, but that's the other thing. If I jump back to Dr. Hall, I, 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 I want to make sure our listeners under, understand, you know, the core of this book, the research that you're doing. Uh, uh, in particular, the, this research into these particular slave revolts and the horrors uh, that you document. Yeah, and I, I couldn't agree more with, with what uh, Tyler said, the self-care. I mean, I, maybe Dr. Hartman can talk about this too. I mean, when you are going into this really meticulous study of the past and of these kinds of events, I mean, how do you, I mean, how do you finish that and then go back and, you know, watch TV? I mean, some of the stuff mm -hmm. is really completely, I mean, just reading it in comic form is overwhelming. So, I mean, can you tell us a little bit more about your research into particularly into these two particular slave revolts? Yeah, uh, it's funny that you use the term horrors of slavery. I'm curious uh, this idea what, because um, I think reading your work, particularly sub scenes of subjection really kind of clued me into kind of what also Dewanda was, was talking about this idea that there's this sort of nightmare that is horrific. And so the only way we can portray it Either we don't talk about it because it, you know, it interferes with black joy, or when we do talk about it, we do it in this particular set of ways that invokes like the the horrors. And for me, it was really about recovering resilience and and resistance. I'm not trying to make light of how difficult some of that research is. I I feel like I don't do that in the book at all. I mean, I try to, but you know, it's not just looking back on things that happened just to to show how how horrible it is you know it's about having our ancestral experiences and our our resources that are there align with our current situation like what we need you know yeah i mean i i agree with you it's it's you know it's very textured i mean i think that even when you're not dealing with you know a document uh you know, that's about some atrocity, just dealing with the most banal piece of paper that is identifying Africans as item of, items of cargo yeah, is right. traumatizing, right? Exactly. So just yeah. that energetic feel is, and, you know, I remember mm -hmm. talking to another historian like Stephanie Smallwood about like what it means to sit in that archive and what it means for you as someone who's connected to these lives, not in a kind of disinterested way, but actually viscerally, you know, connected, connected through history, aspirations and longings. And I mean, I think for me, like when I think about enslaved people, uh, there is the utter terror and domination that structures the institution. And there is the ongoing daily practice against that. There's the plantation and there's the plot against it and what it meant <laughs> Or, mm -hmm. and, you know, enslaved Africans in the U.S. to be at war with, like, you know, the, a great empire, right? And I think mm -hmm. that what Rebecca and I share, it's like, oh, we can't, you know, evaluate those practices, those actions, those revolts in terms of, like, success or failure. All we need is, like, the chronicle of them, right? And that's what, you know, that's mm -hmm. the legacy for us. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I feel like when people read Scenes of Subjection, it's like, even though I, you know, critique that one dimension that like focuses on the spectacular scenes, mm -hmm. but the practice part of it drops out because like, you know, every day there's a practice of freedom inside the most brutal context of domination. And mm -hmm. I feel like you, you know, you walk that line and just the kind of the connections that you make between those histories of revolt and your grandmother's lessons of like struggle and resilience and what your great grandfather did and, you know, your uncle, your dad, your mother, yourself. So I just think that I don't take at all for granted what it means just to be here. 
And as long as exactly. we're here, there's a kind of potentiality that resides in that. Mm, beautiful, beautifully said. But tell us more about your family because you, you told me this, I think the other time I interviewed you that I did not realize that your connection uh, in your family to slavery. Which, which became, it kind of, more in the in the audio drama than I was expecting it, it to be. Um, so my my father was Harry Haywood. He was born in 1898. Fought in World War One. Joined the Communist Party right after Red Summer in 1919, and was really instrumental in the Communist Party's defense of the Statsboro Boys and all these different things. He wrote a book his first book in 1948 called uh, Negro Liberation, which was like a, a kind of like a, a black Marxist understanding of race uh, um, and how black people in the black belt. So he was the one that first person to articulate the idea that there's the self that black people in the South make a, a nation and, and should have self-determination applying like Lenin's theories on nationalism. And, you know, he never finished eighth grade, but he, was sent by the party and spent years studying at the Lenin School in, in Moscow in the in the 30s. So he was the youngest of three children. And his parents, my grandmother Harriet Thorpe, was born in 1860 uh, on a farm in Missouri. And my grandfather, Haywood Hall, also born in 1860 on a plantation in Tennessee. So I was born in, in 1963, so they were they died long before I was around. But the, the 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 point is that there's just two generations between me and my family that were born enslaved, and it's always been a central part of my identity and understanding. And I feel like this book has helped me sort of tie it together in a way that it's like there's not these sort of random like, well, there's this weird fact about me, and there's this weird fact about me. There's this way that creating this, this book and then talking about the book a lot after has really sort of been like, oh, okay, all this starts to fit together in a way that makes sense now. Kind of that, that perspective you get as you, as you get older. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going to jump uh, to Dewanda again here. But I, I really would love to know more about uh, how an actor takes this material and goes from the printed page, you know, and, a, and an unusual printed page being comics you know, to uh, to working with other actors uh, and, you know, what your experience in working with this production. Well, I will say, you know, the way that we produced this series and, you know, the studio that it was filmed in and the, you know, just the, the format of all of it, it's a very specific uh, medium for an actor to perform in. Uh, very technical, you know, the proximity to the microphone, making sure you're not doing sound pages. But I think, you know, I, I will say as a producer, really the all you have to do is get phenomenal actors in the room. And a um, good friend of mine from all like over 10 years back, Larry was able to to do just that. So, I mean, it's always very helpful when you have just a phenomenal group of, of performers who were game. And, you know, we had all the technical support we needed. We had all the like the accent work. And, and so for me, very, very simply in this instance, you know, you, you read it, you, I talk to Rebecca, I give my best facsimile of her very specific and iconic voice, which she didn't know she had until, you know, this year. And mm -hmm. It's my serious tone. It's the gravelly it's nature. It's immediately recognizable. So I, I think what our brilliant director, our brilliant director made sure of was that we recognized that for this format, same thing with the podcast, right? We're in the ear of our listener, which means we are in the mind of our listener. That's how sound you know, operates in the body. So, you know, for her asides, for Rebecca's asides, we were working technically with this microphone where I didn't have to talk above a whisper. And that's a very different experience viscerally for a listener 
you know, than having someone be like, life is hard. Why do they keep firing me? <laughs> you know, so, so a lot of it was just. That's in the blooper reel. That's in the blooper reel. There's more, there's, more there's more room for you to, to bring something to the performance, I, I assume. There's more room for it to be visceral and to drop in um, to a deeper level. And you're in a room, you're in a booth. So there was space for me to tap into what has been painful and difficult in the excavation, channeling the excavation that Rebecca had to, like mustering up the courage to go back into the research. All of that in the simultaneity of her life and the conversation of the research just honoring it and allowing, you know, giving myself the space to get into the space, so to speak. Well, now we've touched on this a little bit before. The, the, the audio drama, it really does bring in much more of your life and much of your teaching life and the challenges and the obstructionism you face. Um, but also there's some very delightful parts with the, uh, where your students are portrayed. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Maybe you and Tyler can, can talk about mm -hmm. how that was brought into the production. Absolutely. Just before we do that, I wanted to just say a couple of things. Learning this whole process of how to how to do sound. I mean, it took everything for me to like do visual. I mean, I mean, I'm not like really, really a visual. I mean, I guess we all are, but I didn't think of myself as a visual person. So I had to get in touch with that. And now, and then I was like, sound. Like, what is that? And it was fascinating. And one of the reasons why I wanted to put together a conversation like this is that during the actual production of the thing itself, it was clear that this idea of not wanting to be like, this is a horrors of slavery story, you know, uh, the composer, Jace Clayton, you know, he and the director and I were on board right away, like, and he was like, I am not creating a soundscape that's like the middle passage scene in Amistad, like, that's not happening, you know, and this has come up repeatedly, which is why I thought it'd be interesting to talk with, with you all this idea and Tyler and and Dewanda, who you, who you've played in Slave Women. I mean, you you were in Underground, which I think for me, I think it's the best show I've seen on on Slave Resistance. Uh, that's how I first learned of of you was your work there, where you play a Gullah Geechee. She's like, I know what I play it. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, yeah, I'm very and, proud of that show for that same reason. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and 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 like you know when I was creating. And creating the book, you know, this whole scene about the the Negro fiend in 1708 who's burned alive at the stake. Like, it was important for me to tell that story in the graphic narrative, but it was also important not to show her burning at the stake. And so I made a very conscious choice, you know, Hugo and I, that we were going to see people's reactions to it or people being sort of forced to watch it, but we weren't going to be engaged in any kind of you know, pornographic, whatever, about, you know, these horrors. But I think what happened when we went into production, so it was like this back and forth, with like, you know, Tyler, you know, three months, you know, we'd have a Zoom call, then, you know, three months would go by, then another version would come by. It was very, like, back burner. And then it hit production, like, really quick. Like, I met DeWanda on Zoom. I think it was, like, the Friday, and then production started on Monday, and then it was, like, six days of insanity. And... um it was like I had, and this is the how it connects to your question, Kelvin. It does connect. Is that that there was this feeling of like I was losing my. Can I, I'm assuming I can't swear. I was losing it, at like my mental health. You know, just watching people perform my my trauma. Basically, these these experiences of of getting fired and watching these things that I was building so carefully for students that I care so much about be dismantled and destroyed repeatedly was so painful. And and so it was my job while I was being in production to like watch through the Google camera and send notes because there was all so many technical things. I don't know, Tyler, how much you deal with this in your writing, but like there was this whole uh, classroom scene where I'm at the University of Utah School of Law teaching constitutional criminal pr procedure. And I, and I need to walk people through kind of some fourth amendment stuff and some of the language got kind of turned around. And I was like, no, we got to get this exactly right. I don't want people coming for me later saying, well, you were fired because you didn't know the difference between yeah, I, probable I, cause and reasonable suspicion. That's why you were fired, you know what I mean, or whatever. So I had to be right there. And it was just, I felt like I was 
I wanted to crawl under the coffee table and just like, it's like an incredible vulnerability spotlight and just, and seeing like Simone, the director, I wish she could have been for this conversation, like have her go up and direct Dewanda and say things like, well, you know, she's talking to her son, Caleb about this video game, but you know, really what the game means to her is it's this area of her life where she has some control, unlike mm -hmm. all the others. And it's like, why do you know this stuff? You're not, you're not my therapist, you know? <laughs> and then, you know, and then I'm like, my actual therapist was like, you should see if somebody else, they know anyone who's gone through similar experience. Maybe that you can share that experience with them. It's like, I don't know how to even go about, it was, it was actually really, really hard. And still even listening to it now is hard. Like I was listening to it in the car with my son and his girlfriend, part of it, um, they loved you, Dewanda, by the way, in, in, in uh, Jurassic World. That, that, that was the thing that clinched it. It's like, oh, she's yeah. playing you? But she was in Jurassic World. I'm like, yes. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> but I was like, I, I had to actually turn it. I had, was like, I have to stop listening. It's too, it's too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the, Tyler did this incredible thing where she created this character, Harper, who was played by... Shante Adams, who just knocked it out of the park. I, for me, I feel like the heart of that story is actually the relationship between Dr. Hall and and um, Harper, even though like you were going about how the heart was kind of like this home thing and the relationship with Ben, et cetera. But, and, and like, I thought it was the most moving stuff to one the two, the two of you performing together was so powerful. And so I feel like Harper was really kind of a combination. I mean, I've had a range of students who, you know, who like, who tracked me down after I was denied access to anything, you know, who were like, thank you because of you, I got a full scholarship and now I'm actually going to medical school and, you know, things like that. But like, that if we hadn't done anything to make these things connect, they would have just thought, I don't know, that I got fired because I was a bad teacher and they were like, and I wouldn't have known anything about about them. And so it, it was just very painful. I think the student characters were important for me, specifically Harper, because it was a way for me to ask the questions that I needed to ask to write the script. So I was using Harper as a conduit for me to say, okay, in layman's terms, what does this mean? <laughs> so a lot of the law explanation scenes were m me as a writer sort of figuring them out. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then also saying how, uh, if I could go back in time and be a student again, which I think we're students all the time, but be mm -hmm. in a classroom and say, how would I want history taught to me? If, if I had like, you know, been lucky enough to have Dr. Hall as my mm -hmm. teacher, how would not she too late. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to sign up as mm -hmm. soon as I can. Um, if that. I could get her as my teacher, how would she teach this to me? And it really ca came from so many of our conversations that we were already having um uh, and i was especially interested because at the time i was in a writer's room on a show that was taking place during the revolutionary war um and Can you say which show it's outlander on outlander. stars i don't mm -hmm. know if they're mad i don't know we don't work together anymore um, but, um <laughs> i don't know they already paid me they can't ask there me go. Yes, yeah. 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 <laughs> so <laughs> at the time it was very interesting to work on these two things simultaneously and see outlander is um you know a show that's mostly set in scotland and be in a world um that's completely devoid of uh, black people just completely mm -hmm. um and working on wake which is set in the exact same time mm -hmm. pretty much in the exact same areas mm -hmm. um at my um season was set in new york and and the colonies it was wild and so i think wow. um the the student characters were also just me asking questions like well they say that we like sold each other into slavery like what's the real truth behind this how can you tell me how this works and i think when i was reading wake and reading about like the specificity of the kinds of weapons and the specificity of like the direction in which a boat or a ship has to go all those things are things i've never contemplated before and so mm -hmm. reading um dr hall's work it it opened up a space for me to not feel ashamed of not knowing these things and also mm -hmm. have the ability for my curiosity to 
um, work in my favor in terms of like page count and saying like I can add some more questions um, <laughs> with these characters. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm i really proud of those classroom scenes. Those were the ones I had like the most fun writing because it was just a way for me to put as much history in it without it being so um, too expositional and not interesting. And mm -hmm. kids in general, I just like writing teenagers, especially because they tell the truth. Yeah, if I can jump in for a second off of a point that I think you just made, I, I was very fascinated by the the, uh, the techniques or strategies of the professional historian. Certainly your, uh, your discussion of dealing with the various archives around New York and in Europe and in London and with Lloyds of London. So uh, uh, Dr. Hartman, I mean, could you comment on this uh, also of the, of, about what historians do and the tools they use to do it? Yes, I mean, uh, one of the things that I love about the scene of Lloyd's in London, it's like, oh, no, you can't have access to these records if it's a history of slavery and the slave trade. Oh, if you're doing something about the evolution of the insurance industry or <laughs> these other framings, then maybe you can have access, but we know those histories are totally, you know, um, interlinked and i think that i mean um you know certainly when i was reading about rebecca's experience i mean there is this um you know you encounter a document and you want to tell a story and there's so little that document is actually able to tell you about the life that you want to write about so mm -hmm. what do you so you just meet it with all the knowledge you have to try to open it up. And then there are other documents that are, that just like resonate with so much violence. You just have to send them away and like pack your bag and go home for the day because you're just mm -hmm. feeling the reverberations of that violence, which is still which is still open, which still feels alive. So, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. you know, but I think that there is a way that, you know, you know, we have to think about these documents as interested, as written from a particular perspective. And we know in terms of, you know, with the British slave trade, we know that they hid, what is it like millions of documents because they didn't want, so it wasn't like, oh, they were filed incorrectly. They just simply hid it right? Because they don't want people to know the story. It's precisely because of the way this, you know, history shapes that the structural inequality and dispossession that we're living in today, right? Mm -hmm. and so if we can articulate that clearly, just like the New York Times series of articles on Haiti, we get to say, no, like, we are owed <laughs> billions, in fact, mm -hmm. right? That all mm -hmm. of this Extraction and theft and debt created your wealth, mm -hmm. and so and so. I think that that's part of the you know the encounter with the document. I mean, for me, it's also a very spiritual thing. I mean, I think that in some way, people who are involved in historical labor, there's uh, there has to be a love of the document. There's something that's alive when you encounter the document, mm -hmm. and so I think that even as there's so much violence. There's, there's also the potentiality of opening and telling different kinds of stories, you know? So, so yeah, so it's a complex labor, you know, like any other. All right. I, you know what? This is a comics podcast. And I, I if we don't talk about Hugo Martinez, uh, you know, I'll lose my comics podcaster's license. So please tell us more about- As well you should. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You forgot he does about him. About I mean, his work is very raw and powerful. I, you know, for me, it seemed to really fit. But he has a great knack also for coming together with these scenes that overlap the past and the present, and it really gives you a great perspective. It really mm -hmm. kind of gives you this, you know, um, sense of what where we're going with it. So tell us more mm -hmm. about uh, how you found. Yeah, that. yeah. So, I mean, it, it was like a kind of a fluke. I mean, I, Calvin, I think you might know the origin story, but, you know, like, you know, I got fired. I'm like, I'm tired of trying to do this. I need to, you know, bring this work and in, out in the public and then I'm out, I'm out, you know. And, but my idea was that it was going to be self-published or a small press or whatever. So we had this, you know, Kickstarter campaign. 
to raise like $5,000, right? So I had tried working with a couple of artists earlier and I was just paying them like a per page rate, I don't know, $100 or 150, I don't remember, on a credit card because I was fired. So it didn't work with any of them. I didn't get a good sense. And then, you know, my friend, like Hugo, we have a share of friend. We have a mutual friend. And she's like, you need to get in touch with my friend. You go. He lives in New Orleans. He he works full time as a pedicab driver, but he he loves comics. He loves drawing comics. And um, I think he even went to art school. And so we connected and, you know, he sent me some, he'd done some web comics, kind of nothing big, nothing more than several pages, nothing published by any kind of, you know, and he, his people are from, from Nicaragua. He's like first generation. I loved his work. I felt it was so powerful. And I wanted somebody who, who would do that sort of pen and ink hand-drawn work because it speaks to me more powerfully than any digital work does. Uh, that's probably a conversation for another, another day, <laughs> but I, I just, and, and the issue of like temporality, I mean, that was, I mean, Hugo and I worked, neither of us knew what we were doing. So we worked together. It, it's not like I wrote this and then passed it on. And I mean, it was like, I mean, this next book, I hope it's going to go so smooth, but then it was just like crazy. Like there's this page in the, prologue that has uh, where I say like I was born to tell the story and it's like a it's a, a full pa page and it's got uh the panels are cre created by like the wake of a slave ship that took us probably over 20 hours just trying to like talk it through he would rough sketch it he would pencil it he'd send it this doesn't work this doesn't work and I mean it so or the whole scene of you know where the book opens in new york city and you're in new york city and you're seeing now but you're seeing the yeah. history of slavery throughout i mean so much discussion like should she be on the subway should she be like why can't i be in the courtroom the courtroom where the four women are sentenced let me actually physically be there and you know it, it was just all these i mean i read all these crazy books on like the anthropology of time i read some like you know, wild physics books on, on time, like the order of time, like Carlos Bravelli, like all this stuff and, you know, and the connection between space and time and, you know, just like, okay, so is this, this is like a site, a circular type of time. What does that mean? How can the story, and, 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 and that's how Alele was characterizing, you know, where she's in the beginning and then she comes back in the end, you know, kind of for the future. So a lot of thought went into that, into the actual layout. And so Hugo and I did that together um the only thing where i was just like you do it you figure it out was any kind of action scene like just do it get back to me about it i, I don't care you know <laughs> like, like the battle scenes in in um like the dahomey battle scenes or even mm -hmm. the 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 revolt 1712 revolt mm -hmm. um the, those those scenes as well can I yeah. say, I just thought that Hugo's design was just so powerful because I was reading it as articulating a theory of time, just the way you're in these kind of, you know, double dimensions on the page. It's very subtle, but it's very powerful. And just like you work explicitly with the notion of like the two voices or the doubled voice, you, mm -hmm. you totally feel yourself in that and it has everything to do with the visual images. So I think that mm. you, you hit it, you got it. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, we're doing that for the current work now. It's gonna be, yeah, thank you. All right, <laughs> well, I, I feel like I, I should be scheduling the next interview. If you've got a second book coming, I, I think we all wanna know more about it. But but you know what I wanna know right now is, okay, we've seen this new development as an audio drama. Is there more coming? Is there, you know, what about movies? What about TVs? What about whatever what can you tell me not tell me <laughs> i don't know what i'm allowed to tell you or not tell you oh my God. i'm having really we had some really interesting conversation with steph curry's production company when after he put, picked wake for his book club but then that kind of like their production company needed to narrow down and so they're focusing on i guess sports stuff yeah which makes sense um and, and now I'm in um, conversations with a, how about let's say a large public British documentary people. That's so specific. I know whatever happens, it has to be as amazing as both of these things are. So 
uh, it will be as thoughtful and intentional and epic. Thank you. And I think they have some way to finally get me access to maybe Lloyd's of London. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> ah, we're just trying to get to Lloyd's, guys. That's all I'm trying to do. All right. Well, th this this is probably as good a time as any to wrap this up. Any final uh, reflections uh, from anyone on the panel? Just feel free. I mean, I just want to say Simone's name again. She's like mm -hmm. such an yeah. integral a part of, uh, part of this. Um, she's just like completely wonderful. I wish she was here to join us, but um, I just want to make sure that we we speak of her and mm -hmm. she's just mm -hmm. brilliant. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the cast was, I thought was incredible. Yeah. And shout out to our phenomenal crew who literally put us in line and kept us on our marks. It was, yeah. it was uh, very thoughtful and done with a lot of love, the, the entire thing. So very, very thankful for that. Well, look, I, I want to thank all of you. I want to thank Dr. Hall for, uh, you know, uh, making this happen, for making the book, for, for being the source of this. Uh, and, you know, as I usually end these shows, thank thanks to all of you for being on More to Come. Thank you.